Welcome back to the Talk Shop Podcast. Today's guest is a good friend of mine that I met a couple years back in Detroit, Michigan. We were on a trip, a business trip from a mutual friend, and we both were looking at real estate together to invest out there. We didn't end up buying any properties, but we did meet each other, and uh, and that was definitely worth the trip. We became very good friends ever since. I've been visiting him in Austin. He's been coming here to visit me. We talk business all the time. And since I've known Shai Kiviti, he went from working at Alvarez and Marcel, a super big consulting firm, comparable to BCG and all those other big boys. And then he moved on to this super, super cool tech firm based out of Israel and now Austin, Texas. So I wanted Shai on the podcast because I wanted you on the podcast, Shai, because real estate is so much more than just buying a house or an apartment complex. And many, many, many people don't know that because they're just getting started and what they see is what's right in front of them, right? But as you grow in the business, as you learn more, you realize how little you know and how much more there is to this world filled with infrastructure. And I wanted you to enlighten some people on what you do. I'll let you introduce what you do and open people's mind to the world of real estate. So Shai, please introduce yourself. I came to this country about six years ago. Originally, born and raised in Israel, grew up there, served in the Israel Defense Forces for almost a decade in a, in a several special forces units, as you, as I, uh, and that's as much as I can say about that. <laughs> <laughs> of course, naturally, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, if I'll say some more, I'll have to kill you. Oh, I see, I see, I see. <laughs> came, came here about six years ago to go to, gra- to my graduate school studies. I lived in Philly for about a year and a half, lived in Boston for the last five years, and then I just moved to Austin as part of Forum Analytics to open the U.S. headquarters there. So what is Forum Analytics? Sure. Forum Analytics, we are the Google Maps of everything underground electricity, water, gas pipelines, telecommunications. Basically, if you want and you need to know what's underground, we are your go-to solution. And, you know, it's crazy how much people don't think of what's underground, but 15% of all of the construction delays in the U.S. are a result of you starting to build, and then you hit something you didn't even know was there. How much does 15% of all construction delays equate to, for example? Put it in numbers for me. A hundred billion dollars. Is that, that, is is that, that accurate? Big? Somewhat accurate, yes. Yes. So a hundred billion dollars in delays is caused from what not knowing what's underground. Yes. Wow. And you know, we've been putting things underground for the last 200 years. And at some point, it starts getting busy over there. You know, you put another pipeline, another pipeline. And... I said that, but unfortunately, we were never really good at documenting what we were putting underground. So there are things that were never documented. There were things that were documented poorly. So let's say you get an ass build, you get a plan to put a pipeline somewhere, but the GCNs are putting it a little bit to the right or a little bit to the left. They don't go back to update the ass build. So, so you got this plan of where the pipeline should be, but in reality, it's... It's, I don't know, 10 feet away, 20 feet away. Yeah, but how do you know that? Like, how do you know that they made a mistake? In short, we've built a time machine. So we have satellite images of the entire U.S. going back 70 years. And we use machine learning and computer vision algorithms to basically go backwards and forward in time and, sh- and see the actual construction. So I can tell you, hey, this pipeline is not here, it was put 20 feet away, and here is a satellite image from 1995 showing the actual trenches where it was dug, and you can see that it wasn't put where you think it is. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. You see, I would have never thought of anything like this. Like, it never even crossed my mind while I was out there trying to buy another house, a multifamily in Houston, a multifamily in Arkansas, an industrial building. I never even thought about this type of startup. And even my family, remember when you were telling them, they were all, it was like a light bulb just went off in everybody's head. So where did this come from? So our CEO, our CEO Itzik, 
he's a, he's a super bright guy. He was a mine. He opened a mine excavation company in Israel, basically starting to clear out mines from the Golan Heights and the northern part of Israel. And at a certain point, he 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 kept seeing how the mines were all in a ser- specific location, and despite that, he had to clear the entire area just for liability reasons. And he started saying to himself, to himself, what if I could, using technology, know where the mines are before I start excavating them? I would save so much labor. And he started using aerial imaging to basically look at uh, change detection on the ground and on surface features in order to understand where the minefields are. And time after time again, he would go to the owner, which is in Israel, the Department of Defense, and tell them, hey, all of the mines are in that area. Can I excavate just that, that specific area? And they would tell him, no, you have to excavate the entire area that we asked you for liability reasons. And time and time again, he would excavate the entire area and, and guess what he found? And he was right. He was right. The mines were exactly where he was. So with that, he said, okay, I am onto something. He tried fundraising. Unfortunately, no venture capital would invest in a in the mine excavation market, and definitely not in a company that could blow up and take the founding team together with a company. And at a certain point, he he started looking for other use cases for the technology, and that's when he found the subsurface utility engineering market (SUE) which is basically the market that you use to do risk mitigation on your construction, pre-construction. And, you know, that market is so fragmented. Think about it like that. Every township, every city, municipality, county, state, each of them has their own database of what's, what utilities they have underground. And... I can tell you that in Texas alone, we gathered over 97,000 data layers of just what's underground. So, so just all of those databases have, and, and the, most of them are publicly available. Just taking all of those databases and putting it, and turning it into one source of truth, what we call building a conflation engine that conflates all of them to a single layer, just that is a huge technological challenge. Yeah, Th- think of I can imagine you know, you, you have two databases looking at the same road. One of them tells you the gas pipeline is on the right side of the road. The other one tells you it's on the left side of the road. So the first question is, do you have one gas pipeline or two? And if you have only one, which one is true? Because it's two publicly available databases and they show different things. Yeah. So how do you answer that? The time machine. 4M. Well, in honor of your time machine, I don't know if you noticed, but I wore these socks oh. with pipes on them, some electricity, stuff like that. <laughs> you know, this was uh, in honor of 4M. You, you just need to change the, the color to orange. And, and, and I'm matching the branding. Yeah, and we'll give you a job. Well, Shai, other than 4M, and before we talk about it more or anything, you have a really interesting story about your journey to America when you got here, you went to Harvard, then you did your graduate studies at UPenn, Wharton School of Business. And I think people will find it interesting, because I definitely do, about how that experience was. How was it to get into Harvard? How was it at Harvard? Uh, you were recently featured in in the Globes, right? The Boston Globes, yes. The Boston Globes, uh, about speaking out against Jewish activities at Harvard, how how they treat Jews at Harvard. Well, well I never, I'm never against Jewish activities at Harvard. Yeah, I, yeah, I was the speaking way. against the folks who are against Jews at Harvard. <laughs> yeah, so tell us about Harvard. Sure. Harvard was, you know, uh, underwhelming, if I want to say. Seriously? Yeah. And underwhelming. Yes, and, you know... Are you uh, like a super genius? No, no, no. This, no I, those I, are super I, genius I, words. I, my, um, what I'm trying to say is that people perceive it as more than it is. And, you know, you have this perception as a kid as like this is the place you want to go to and you invest so much effort and so much energy 
in planning and in applying, you know, we didn't have chat GDP at the time to write your application essays. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so <laughs> you, you had to do it yourself. And, you know, you going there really was at a certain point a dream come true. But then, you know, you go in there and you find out that at the end of the day, it's just people. And I have a lot of friends, a lot of super talented friends from Israel, especially those that I, I met in the special forces that would have never gotten to get to Harvard. But talent-wise, they were much more talented than many of the folks I met. And like in a, with any institution, there are folks that you under, you think should have gotten in and didn't, and folks that you meet there and you're like, how did that get, person get in? Yeah. What did he do? So, so, you know, I, at the end of the day, it's, it's people, and it's people that know how to submit really great applications, and some of them are really smart. But I can tell you that going there is by no mean a, a recipe for success. So, so you know, In your eyes, what is the recipe for success? Well, I have a three-and-a-half-year-old and a, a two-year-old, so, you know, having a happy family... And having friends, for me, for me, that's better than any any brand that you can uh, that you can uh, that you get into or put on your resume. Yeah, I see. And now financially, you know, money is never a, a bad thing to have. Yeah, but you must uh, you must have some friends that came out of Harvard with super successful, right? Super success stories. So, so, so there are a lot. There are a lot that came into Harvard super successful. I see. Uh, there is one person that you know is also one of my good friends, um, and he has a really interesting story. His name is Daniel Achempon, and at Harvard he started a venture capital called the Visible Hand. He basically th- that VC basically only invests in underserved uh, populations. Wow! So the co- the term Visible Hand is an uh, an uh, amalgamy a phrase to resonate with Adam Adam Smith's invisible hand, basically saying, hey, we're at a place where only 1% of the venture capital investments go into um, underserved people of color, minority populations. And we, we need to, and the invisible hand isn't working. We're going to create a VC called the visible hand to invest only in those folks. And we believe that there is potential there. And the guy raised significant money and, you know, he really used his education to not only build a successful business, but also do good. Yeah. Yeah, but now ESG is extremely popular. I'm assuming this was done before the wave of ESG investing and underserved communities, right? Y- you know, he he had to really hustle. He had to really hustle and, you know, to ra- raising money wasn't easy for a go like that. And uh, Some of it was philanthropies. But also he was able to bring in some investors that are ROI driven. They said, no, we, we see that there is a good deal flow there and you can actually make money on investing in people of color that other folks would not invest in. Do you credit your wide network of people to going to Harvard? Because you know more people than almost anyone I know. And successful people, people with a head on their shoulders, people that are willing to help and talk to you and communicate and have great stories. W- well, you're a successful person with a head of your shoulders, and you never went to any business school, right? Uh, yeah, I went to Hofstra. Uh, Hofstra, which uh, is not a, uh, which is a pretty good school. I, it's okay. Yeah, Hofstra's all right. It's uh, I would like to see them more strict with their uh, <laughs> <laughs> with their admissions, but uh, but it's all right, especially after you graduate and you do well. You're like, damn, <laughs> don't let those people in. They need uh, to work harder. But uh, but, but we met in Detroit. Yeah. W- which is also, uh, you know, Detroit. Yeah, of uh, all places. Of all places. But, but you know, pu- in all seriousness, um, I, I going there was great, and having that thing on your resume is also great. But, um, you know, I, I'm now serving as the head of the Wharton Israeli Alumni Club, and I talk to a lot of folks in their MBA process, and I tell all of them, look, if you are on track, your last job in life, you, you, the last job that you should submit a, a resume to is your first job going out of business school. Be, because... Wait, say that again? 
if you're on track, you shouldn't be submitting your resume anywhere. But, but generally speaking, you, the last job that you should submit your CV to, your resume, should be your first job out of business school. Because after that, you want to be in a place where the next opportunity you get is not going to be because you have a really good resume with, a, I don't know, Harvard, McKinsey, Goldman Sachs, Ch- Google, choose a name brand on your resume. Because once you go to those places, mm-hmm. you, un- you understand how, mu- how easy it is to, to make your resume say whatever you want it to say. Mm-hmm. You want to be in a place where someone picks up the phone, someone has an opportunity, and they think who would be the right person for that opportunity. And the answer would be, you know, alone, he's the right person. Let's pick up the phone and, and te- ask him if he's available or if he's searching for a job or yeah. even if he's not, if he's going to consider. And I think that that only comes when you hustle and you work hard and you impress folks and not I- when you accumulate brands and, and i can also tell you that going to Harvard also you know in certain situations it actually makes things a bit harder so, so i go into a room and i automatically have to i automatically have to deal with like people thinking i i'm arrogant or i'm a rich person or which you, you didn't come from any money no Definitely. My, uh, my father was a factory worker at PepsiCo, 35 years. My mom was a high school teacher. Um, so, b- but having that automatically uh, creates that sense. And you know, I say that because I, we're in an industry in which being down to earth, being grounded and interacting with folks matters more than anything. And I can tell you that, you know, I usually don't say to I, I usually don't reveal that I went to Harvard because I, I feel that it's gonna do more harm than good. What about you, Penn? Wharton School of Business. That was a great experience. Really? I loved it. Yeah. Best two years of my life. No way. Uh, d- d- dude, that uh, but first off, remember that I went there after a decade in the army. Yeah. So but yeah, w- we partied so hard and U Penn and Philly in general is always gonna have a great place in my heart. Also, great Jewish community, really. Oh, really? Yeah, I've never, I've never been, I've never been in the Wharton School. So, great place, great food. They have great hummus everywhere. Oh, that's you know, in Boston, it's really hard. In Boston, it's really hard to find a good hummus. Seriously? Yeah. I mean, who's at fault for that? I don't know, but there is a bigger Jewish community in Boston than in Philly, but it's still harder to find good hummus in Boston. How are the Israelis and the Arabs not going to the streets? I mean, the hummus community is one. That's where at least where we see eye to eye. Well, you know, they're too busy going to school. Uh, They're too busy (laughs) at the library. Uh, That's funny. Too busy debating something else. Exactly. And and by the way, there is also the opportunity cost. Never forget that. Of fighting for good hummus in in the Boston market. Yep. Yep. Maybe we should open a hummus place. You know, Avgi's next... uh, Next acquisition. Yeah, I, I see that as us solving major problems <laughs> of opening a new hummus place in Boston. Definitely. Oh, man, that's interesting. It clo- it closes some doors. I would have never thought of that either. I mean, I can see, like Eli, when Eli, my cousin, when I told him he went to Harvard, he's like, I could, I look at him like an alien. You know, people see him like an alien. And, and that's before he ever, he ever met me, right? So... When I came in the door, when he met me for the first time, he already had that preconceived motion that I'm an alien. Because he went to Harvard. Yeah. Yeah. Before before I spoke the first word to Eli. Yep. Yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. Look, it does help that you're super sophisticated because you hold your ground when you talk to people. But I can see how a great resume builder that goes to an Ivy League school is so underwhelming as a person. Right? I deal with people all day in my business. And... To me, an Ivy League graduate and uh, a non a non graduate could be on totally different levels, right? An, an Ivy League graduate could be an analyst, while the high school dropout could be a major developer that just knows how to endure those rides. So, I mean, it doesn't. I don't see it as a metric of success, but I could see why a lot of old fashioned people would, right? Yeah. The older generations, my pa- my grandparents would love to hear that. My grandparents from my mother's side, not my Israeli side, Moroccan. <laughs> my my British side 
Well, well I, I can tell you, you know, when I went to Harvard, I was already married. But I can tell you that... Which, by the way, you have a fantastic wife. Oh, she's... Who's also amazing. a super genius. She, she, she's much smarter than I am. Ali so speaks what? Five languages? Five languages. She's a hardcore hardware engineer. You know, the, the best thing uh, I love about my life is that my two daughters, they have this pink toy laptop and these pink headsets. And I'm going to tell you what they do, but you, you have to understand that that comes from their mom. They take their cute toy laptop and they put their pink headset and they put it on the table and when I come to them they're like daddy I'm working five minutes go away no yes. <laughs> oh. it's the cutest thing ever three and a half years old pretending she's coding that's come awesome on. destined for greatness exactly right I remember walking into your your wife's office a couple days ago when I was in Austin and I'm like what are you doing it's you know she just hasn't stopped she would yeah, she's just like that all day long and somehow TSMC ends up printing chips in Taiwan two years later. Yeah, because of Alice. Yeah. You know, th the moment she joined AMD, that's when the, uh, the shell press started going up. So. Uh, you give her credit for that. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Now, you came from Alvarez and Marcel, which you could give more background on that company because I have not been part of the consulting world. I understand what a big industry it is, but I don't understand really how the intricacies, right? How did it, how does it feel coming from such a, a corporate structured environment if that's what it was like to an israeli high growth startup i think you guys just raised 45 million dollars a total right? of 45 yeah at what valuation i can't say that okay yeah. so how does it feel but, but a, a good one yeah so it's it's definitely north of of uh of nine digits right nine figures which you can't say but anyway just a guess how does it feel coming from a structured environment like Alvarez and Marcel and going into a high-paced, high-growth startup? So, so, you know, Alvarez and Marcel is very different in the consulting landscape. And your question would have been the right question if I would have came from any other consulting company. But Alvarez and Marcel is a consulting company that has a legacy in restructuring. So they led the Enron restructuring, the Lehman Brothers, the Toys R Us, you know, the restructurings where even if you're not familiar with the term restructuring, you might have heard of. And Enron, Lehman, Enron. Toys yes. R Us. You know, you, know, you just dropped three bombs. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that means that the company has a very, has a core operational legacy. 50% of the consultants are not those kind of, uh, what you think of as consultants, um, you, which you could call like slide makers who sit all day in the office and create these beautiful strategy slides. You go to other companies for that, but that, we have that, but that's like 50% of the labor. The other 50% are, are hardcore operators, folks who are CEOs, COOs, CFOs, and you, know, you can deploy them to interim roles whenever really bad things happen and you need experts. It's so fascinating. Like, that is so cool. I remember when I would hop on a call with you three years ago and I'm like, Chai, what are you up to? You're like, I'm out in Ohio restructuring a steel framework company or something like that. Something crazy like that. Yeah. What a fascinating business model. It, mu it must be so much fun. And, and, and you know, when, when I went to work there, I graduated in May 2020. Wow. So I, I told myself, well... You know, the entire world's economy is going to hell. Where should I, what should be my next step in my career? And I was like, well, you know, restructuring sounds like a pretty good idea in 2020. Which was a great pick. Yep. Dude, I, I spent two years um, doing so many things. I, I took part in interim COO and interim CFO uh, teams. I, I wasn't obviously the interim CEO or the interim CFO. That was my boss's boss, but. I took part in those kind of teams for companies that required massive turnarounds extremely quickly. So, so you know, most of my cl most folks, when they try to exit consulting into being an operator, it's a pretty hard change. You know, you need to learn a new skill set. It's a different mindset. And for me, I was very fortunate to have had a lot of operating experience in a consulting company, and that made the transition to be an operator a lot easier. How old were you when you graduated? 30. It's 
Never too 31. late. 31. Never too late. Oh. And that's inspiring, and, and, Shy. And, and you know, most of my classmates were at that age. No way. Yeah, most of the folks starting their MBA in the U.S. are like starting their MBA when they're 28 years old. 27, 28. You know, you need three to four years of experience. Most of the Israelis starting their MBA are over their 30s because in Israel we have mandatory conscrip- conscription. Yeah. So you need to have three years in the army, do your undergrad, and then an extra three years of experience. Would you suggest somebody go get their MBA? Somebody like me, for example. No. Which, by the way, I'm not I'm not saying that. I'm considering you, it. You, you should not. You should not, and I'll say why. You know, I, 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 I love the work that experience. It did really... It was fun, and it jump-started my career. But I really feel that there are two things that are you need to consider when you go to do your MBA or graduate studies in general. One is the opportunity cost. So, you know, if you want to... You're going to learn more by running a business for, for two years than for from going to business school. No question. And if you have a great idea, you should just pursue it. Because you're going to learn more from that. And most people don't take into consideration that opportunity cost of spending two years in school without a salary, without developing professionally in their career. So, so that's number one. And the second is, you know, there are two types of folks that in business school. One, which I like to call career switchers, which are like myself. I came in after the army. I didn't know what I wanted to do in life. You know, two years in a top-tier business school sounds like a pretty solid idea. Yeah. And they do this random work of, you know, uh, I did some internship at McKinsey. I worked at a VC fund. You try a little bit of everything until you figure out what's what works for you. The other type of folks that know what they want to do. So they, let's say they came from private equity and they know they want to do a startup in clean tech. So they're going to spend the next two years building their startup while in business school. For those two use cases, business school could be great. But if you already have a business and a profession, the opportunity cost could be just so high. And it's not even about the money. It's about the time. Yeah. The, the, I don't think that a person like you t- should should go to business school. I wish I had a wife to credit my success to. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I don't have two adorable little daughters and a wife to say, hey, She's my greatest accomplishment. So I will kindly take your compliment. I appreciate you, Jai. You're a great friend. You always were. And now I would like to pivot back to 4M. So what's the name of the company? 4M Analytics? Yes. Okay. Underground mapping. So hypothetically, just spitballing here, Batman approaches you guys, right? Ideal customer. Yes. He wants to build a new bat cave. That's your client. Yep, either a new bat cave, an extension to the bat cave, issue new permits to the bat cave, anything regarding the bat. Batman cave. doesn't get permits. Well, nobody can know about the bat cave, but an extension. Let's say he wants to break a wall. He wants to know if there's another thing beyond that wall. Underground. Pipeline. Yeah, underground. You know, he doesn't want to break a wall and then hit a gas pipeline, right? So bat, yeah, of course not. God forbid he needs to utilize those gas pipes. Dude, dude that's that's gonna blow his cover. Literally. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Nobody can know. So Batman's an ideal customer. Who else is an ideal customer for something like 4M? So you'd be surprised, but anyone who is in either in the bidding prospecting or the pre-design, design, or risk mitigation stages of an infrastructure project would be able to use that. Currently, we're selling to general contractors, GCs, to designers, to engineer firms, to owners, and you know we're now starting to sell to public owners, so municipalities. So, so that's like who we're selling to right now. But the ability to have one trustworthy map of everything underground has so many additional potentials. We've received an inquiry from an insurance company wanting the data wow. to better price their premiums, wow. or a bank wanting to improve their underwriting processes when they lend money to certain type of customers. This is so fascinating, like yeah. so cool. It's, I mean, and it's not our ideal customer profile. We're, we're, we're you know, so we, we, we get so many inquiries where we say, listen, great, let's talk in two years, not in our focus right now. We need to be laser focused on growing the company. 
but, but you know, slowly and surely we're going to expand to every possible use case of how, what you can do with underground utility. Management. There's these random use cases just popping up, insurance companies, lenders, uh, the contractors you guys have your eye on, architects, MEP, designers, engineers you have your yeah. eyes on. Now, is the long-term objective to like cut out the engineers? I think that we're in an industry where the person is always going to be in the center. We would never want to cut anyone out we would want to empower them. And, you know, the design phase, you, using the right data, you can you, you can cut off six to 12 months from the design of an infrastructure project. Now think of that on a national scale. You can accelerate infrastructure deployment. You can uh, build roads that are better and faster with lo- lower budgets. The opportunities of that are limitless. But you can't do that without the people. At the end of the day, we're never going to be an architect or a designer or a GC. A- and, you know, I don't think it's a good idea to also ever try to cut the middlemen. The U.S. has so many, has such a large lack of labor or gap in, in labor, both in underskilled and skilled folks in the construction industry that we, we have no choice but to find how to make things more efficient. Do you guys have any competitors? Well, let me rephrase that. Who are your competitors? Honestly, I don't think we have any. No, you have competitors. You know, anything could be your competitor. Well, An engineer is your competitor right well, now. Well, it, it really depends on what's your viewpoint. But right? do you have any software competitors? I think is what so you were referencing. Exactly. So it really depends what's your viewpoint. Because we see for... Um, is the basic infrastructure layer that can power the entire industry and can provide value to every actor out there. And, you know, when, when you look at it like that, the, and there is no one else that's trying to map the entire U.S., um, the entire U.S. underground and create a single source of truth. So what you're saying is this is ripe for someone else to jump in right you're saying this is ripe for uh for the taking well you know robbie write that down robbie we've got a new business robbie uh, well, well if you want to compete with us first off you got to raise you know, 45 million dollars <laughs> you know I, what we're doing is really hard and the fact that no one is doing it right now the way we're doing it is just shows how hard it is but i think that the more folks that are in this sector, the better the sector is going to be because competition does a lot, does really good things for everyone. You know, especially in a market that, well, you know GCs, you know owners, you know that adapting technology is hard and doing market education is hard. And, and many of those folks, they may really like you, but they have an inherent challenge in adapting technology. So the more actors out there, the better it's going to be for everyone. And you see that that's the, the market we're in is having a lot of focus on it right now. First off, infrastructure is probably the only industry that is able to pull a country out of a recession, which we're in right now. So, so And you see that the U.S. is doubling down on infrastructure with the Biden infrastructure yeah. bill. Yeah. But you can also see initiatives like the, one, the White House Dig Once initiative and basically a lot of other initiatives meant to make sure that you don't have d- to dig and do potholes multiple times in the same area time and time again just because you don't collect the data and maintain it in the right manner. Yeah. You see, in my eyes, I would never want to compete with you guys. I would never want to get involved in what you're doing because it's not a, a problem that I want to solve. You know, I think a lot of entrepreneurs get lost in just trying to make money that they don't realize that there's a much bigger problem at hand. The, pr- the solution, you know, has to, they have to be passionate about what the problem is in order to really pursue the solution. And, and you know, obviously we want to make money, but we really want, what we really want to do is we want to change the market. We think it, it's just crazy that, you know, people are still digging without having great data of what's underground. People are still hitting utilities when they try to build. That you get hit with delays over delays because you hit something you didn't know was there. 
and that you'll even I- even the fact that you're doing the design without knowing exactly what's underground is crazy to me yeah don't get me wrong i'd love to invest with you guys but uh but that's a conversation for another right. time look i just paid one hundred twenty thousand dollars in engineering costs to to get us a map basically of what's underneath you know my sewage treatment plant well you should have come to us we would have done it much cheaper yeah, well, how long did it take you to get the map? It's the pro- the problem is the mu- are the municipalities. You know, you have to adapt to the municipalities. It's relationships. Somebody has to present it. I think my engineer had to be your customer, really? and if every engineer was your customer because they were forced to with time, prices would come down, and that map would be maybe thirty thousand dollars with all the work it took, rather than a hundred twenty thousand dollars. Well, before we wrap things up. How has your conversations gone with Elon Musk? You know, because this is an Elon Musk business. I mean, come on, the boring company. This is we're in Austin. He's in Austin. Yep. I actually, I actually brought this because I thought it would be fitting for the podcast. (laughs) Well, I I would love to put it on the boring company. Well, you know, we've been trying (laughs) to get in touch with them, and he's not Uh, answering. I think he's busy right now with like his social media business. <laughs> but seriously, Elon, if you're hearing us, I think we can uh, we can supercharge your Boeing company. So let's talk. There it is. Well, Shai, this was awesome. So happy you finally made it on the show. You're the man. Happy you're inspiring. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure.